The Los Angeles Lakers saved the season and possibly the rest of the LeBron James era at the end of the trade deadline. Before the trades, the Lakers were becoming a laughing stock around the league. Their core was either entirely dysfunctional because of Westbrook or constantly injured in the usual AD fashion. Meanwhile, the surrounding pieces are players like Lonnie Walker and Patrick Beverly. Most of us knew the Russ trade wasn't going to work. But even after that, why would the front office think, you know what this team is missing? Stubborn point guards that can't shoot. Let's go get Pat Bev. Look, all I'm getting at is that the Lakers were in a downward spiral. The final years of LeBron James's career were starting to look kind of bleak, trophy case wise. But then the trade deadline saved them. They got rid of Russ and brought in guys like Jared Vanderbilt, D'Angelo Russell, and Malik Beasley. They got a nose to the grindstone type guy in Vanderbilt, a reliable playmaker in D'Lo, and a knockdown shooter in Beasley. They even got Mo Bamba. Rob Polinka. You beautiful genius. LA turned around from fighting to stay out of the 13th spot in the West to, by the end of the season, possibly landing out of the play-in tournament. Now, obviously that didn't quite happen, and they finished as the seventh seed, but the purple and gold are scary yet again. And as this first round continues, it feels like there may be a serious path for LeBron James to land himself back in the finals. Let's break down their route and how they could become just the second seventh seed ever to make the NBA finals. First up, we have the Memphis Grizzlies. I won't lie, this isn't the most ideal matchup in the first round. Memphis is a young team with a lot of heart and a lot of hate towards the Lakers. After that regular season game and the whole Shannon Sharp incident, Dylan Brooks is coming for blood. Even through his inefficient shot chucking, he's coming right for the Lakers' throat. Brooks is basically the trash talker of the Grizzlies. But after rambling on about how old and basically washed LeBron is, the team might end up regretting letting their man go off like that. The series has been competitive, and players like Jaron Jackson Jr. are sure to give Anthony Davis trouble. But if the Lakers can continue to get stellar performances from their surrounding pieces, they can 100% make it out of this. This is a team with a similar structure to the 2020 championship roster. After LeBron and Davis, maybe they don't have a clear number three, but they have a bunch of guys that could be the number three on any given night. One night, it's Austin Reeves. Another, it's Hachimura or someone like Malik will get a hot shooting night. The Grizzlies are fierce competition, but the young team just simply isn't ready, with their leader clearly struggling physically and working through stuff outside of the game. When the Lakers move on to the second round, they'll either run into the Kings or the Warriors. The Kings have had the hot start, but it's hard to rule out Steph, Clay, and Draymond. Either way, here's the thing about those teams. Their interior defensive presence is horrible. Golden State does have Draymond Green, sure, but outside of their aging defensive anchor, who can get suspended from a game at any moment, you're gonna rely on Kevin Looney to have enough pressure against AD and a cutting LeBron? I don't think so. Same with Sacramento. Sabonis is a purely offensive star. He offers very little when it comes to at the rim pressure. Their defense against the Warriors has risen to the occasion, but that's because they're a guard-based team as well. LA has big guys that are about to feast on the boards and finishes. This will be the moment that Anthony Davis needs to be the clear top guy in a series. While along with him, someone like Vanderbilt is gonna be critical. He'd be able to hustle, defend Sabonis, or die for every offensive board and loose ball against the Warriors. None of these series are going to be a cakewalk, but it's a journey we could see them taking. With their last stop before competing for another championship of the Western Conference Finals, it looks like the Nuggets are for sure moving on. But then it's a toss-up between the Clippers and Suns. Either way, for prediction's sake, we're going to have to give the number one seed the benefit of the doubt to get to the Conference Finals. So it's Jokic, Murray, and Michael Porter Jr. versus LeBron, Davis, and their infantry of third guys. An interesting behind-the-scenes element to both of these teams, though, are their power power forwards. Aaron Gordon and Jared Vanderbilt have fairly similar roles on the floor. They're the smart cutting athletic finishers who also need to be the hustlers on defense. Both average two offensive rebounds a game and set exceptional screens for their offensive minded guards. So the key to a Lakers victory is going to be in the front court. Jokic might have surprisingly good defensive advanced stats, but the eye test will tell you that he's not going to have the strength to battle AD down low consistently. So do the Nuggets instead try to put Gordon on him? If that's the case, then okay, we're off to the races. Because that's when Jared Vanderbilt utilizes his unlimited energy and stays in continuous motion on offense. He's setting screens, consistently cutting, and battling for putbacks. Jokic is going to need to keep up with one of these guys if the Nuggets want to quiet down this big Lakers team. Throw in LeBron on top of that, and Denver's going to have to withstand a lot of bully ball. 
Obviously, just like we mentioned earlier, only one seventh seed has ever made the NBA Finals, the New York Knicks back in 1998. They then lost in five against the Spurs, so no seventh seed has ever won a ring. The odds are not in LeBron and the Lakers' favor. But this is no ordinary seventh seed. This has the best player ever to step foot on the court and a plethora of weapons at his disposal. We might be watching LeBron's last incredible feat, and I'm completely bought in.